If this was Sesame Street, I'd be talking to you from a trash can, and today's letter would be F, as in F-bomb. So we're going to go ahead and make an F-bomb today. Right now, I'd like to take this opportunity to dedicate this video to my mom. Um, when I was growing up, I did a lot of stupid things and gave her a lot of opportunities to use the F-bomb, which she never did. I'm not saying I didn't get in trouble. I'm just saying she didn't drop the F-bomb when I did. You're actually watching the third take of this video. The paint I used on the 3D printed pattern never really dried hard. It was kind of a soft paint and it was a different paint that I tried. It was shinier. I thought I could see flaws in it easier so I can sand it, but it ended up never really drying again and it caused the parting powder to stick to it and the sand to stick to it. So again, this is like the third video I filmed and the sand still tucked, stuck to the part, so you'll see I'll have to do some cleanup work after I pull it out of the casting. The F-bomb isn't my creation. I mean, someone, someone else came up with that. I did design it in Tinkercad, but I, I think whoever came up with the idea with using an F and a bomb really hit the nail on the head. I mean, when you drop the F-bomb, you're really doing it from a lot of pent-up emotion or a lot of... Uh, potential energy that you're all of a sudden releasing. So whoever came up with the idea of the F-bomb, man, you, I think they, they really nailed the expression pretty well. I'm putting my sprue and spin trap in. I think it works pretty good. I like the fact that the sprue is tapered, so that way when you make a basin on top and pour your bolt and aluminum in, it slowly and evenly flows over the basin into the sprue. The sprue being tapered eliminates the air out of it. Um, if you'd like to grow your brain and learn more about that, there's a video on the internet called CastCon 2018 Latest Techniques for Casting. And a professor gets up there and talks about all the different things about casting and how to make your castings better. Um, he suggests, you know, using methods uh, to create less turbulence. And then also he demonstrates the difference between using a tapered sprue and a non-tapered sprue in his video. Um, the video quality isn't, isn't very great, but the actual content's pretty good. So if you're interested in casting and want to know how to improve your stuff, I'd, I'd probably suggest going over there and take a peek at that video. I always make a generously sized basin. The end of my crucible doesn't really have a defined spout. So when you go to pour the molten aluminum, it just pretty much starts running over. So to have a bigger spot or a bigger target to land that aluminum in sure helps a lot. So I always make sure I have a decent sized basin in my mold. When I cut my gates and air vents, I usually do it in the cope. And the reason why I usually do it in the cope or the top half is because when my pattern's a half pattern like it is when it has a flat side, it's a lot easier just to go ahead and grind all that material off because the aluminum is going to fill in the gate and it is going to fill in the air holes. And so that way, you, you, you know, to get, to get it cleaned off, it doesn't really matter what the back looks like and it's a lot easier to clean off and I don't have to reshape so much of the casting after it gets done. I always have the compressed air turned on when I'm building up these molds. Just blowing out a little sand out of the mold can improve the surface quality quite a bit. Otherwise, you have these little loose grains of sand rolling around, and then when you pour the aluminum in there, they make pits on your surface and look kind of bad. You can actually get a pretty good casting if you can get your casting um, free of loose sand in it. The day that I filmed this was pretty decent, but I was racing to get this done. At the end of the day, there was a massive sandstorm. They call them haboobs out here, which is like the dumbest thing I ever heard them called. But anyway, that's what people call large sandstorms out here. And again, I put some videos in it if you want to watch that at the end of this video. It's pretty hot out here in Arizona, so I usually wait until I have to start dealing with molten aluminum. And then I go ahead and put my pants and my gear on. Otherwise, normally I do everything else where I wouldn't get burned in shorts. And eventually I'd like to get some um, uh, something to cover my legs that's uh, leather also to prevent burns. I don't think denim's going to stop it very well. 
the aluminum that I'm putting in is a mixture of car parts uh, that have been cast before because they have a high silicon content and cast very well. That's why they're used to cast for car parts. And then also um, I'm using aluminum hard drives. The hard drives have a pretty good silicon content and the chassis were cast to make the hard drives and then machined a little bit. And those work really well too. So usually I have a mixture of those going at the same time. It seems to be proven and works well for me. I picked up a uh, thermocouple and a thermocouple little temperature reader off of Amazon. I think the whole setup was probably just about 50, 60 bucks. And then I made that handle in another video. I try and uh, run along between 1300 degrees Fahrenheit and 1400 degrees Fahrenheit for my pouring temperature. Um, I just found that on the internet. So that's what I normally try uh, to use. I poured hotter and it seems to make a weird surface on my part. Um, so I try and keep it in between there. I think I'm pouring it like 1350 degrees at this point. I think the only reason if I'd pour it hotter would be is if I tried some of the styrofoam uh, pouring it, pouring it to uh, do lost foam casting. And maybe you would need it hotter to burn the foam out and have more energy in the aluminum because it would actually start losing temperature as it's burning off the foam. But I think just for straight pouring it and sand casting, uh, keep it around 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. The 1400 degrees Fahrenheit works pretty well so far. And like I said, I haven't tried foam cast, uh, foam lost foam casting, but I can imagine that you'd probably want your aluminum a little hotter to pour it down through there. So I already poured my casting, but I think I'm going to melt down more aluminum and make some biscuits out of it just so I have um, a little bit more condensed storage for my aluminum. Right now I'm stirring the aluminum and getting the dross off and I'm like, what the heck? I can feel some heat coming through my glove. And uh, so I don't know what happened here, but somehow I got a glove that I use on the belt sander and I ended up sanding the finger off and somehow I switched the gloves while I was using it and I felt the heat come through there. Um, those gloves went in the trash. I have no idea how I got my gloves mixed up during this whole process. Again, I'm just putting more aluminum in there. I'm going to scrap some aluminum and just make it so that way uh, my parts are uh, already burned down into smaller sized little biscuits that fit better into the crucible. I also will mark them at the end of the video so that way I can remember what I made the aluminum ingots out of. So when I go to cast them again, I'll know I'm using the correct aluminum for whatever I want to cast. I think I had my casting sitting to cool for 45 minutes to an hour. And just out of curiosity, I took the temperature. It's about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So obviously I'm going to be wearing gloves when I pull this apart. And the moment of truth, and it looks like my bomb has a beard on the end of it. Yeah, some sand kind of tore out when I removed it from the mold, and there's a couple splotches on it. So we'll have to get creative with the little Dremel tool on that one. For comparison, I purposely left the sand on the casting and you can see it replicated perfectly. There's the beard on the bomb and there's the sand on the pattern. I'm just showing the casting here so you can see the gates and the air vents and how they all worked and that they did work. You can see aluminum went up the air vents after the air left the cavity and the spin trap had a little bit of a air release on it too. So after I performed some Dremel magic and cleaned up the beard off the end of the bomb, and polished it up with the buffing wheel. This is how it came out. You can see the pattern on the right that I did that I did not pick up has lost the paint on it. You can also see I made the F a little too deep and I didn't make the sides angled. It caught some sand and well, there's the result. The other thing too is the recess for the F. I didn't taper. I actually made a new pattern. I was planning on selling a few of these and giving a few to my friends. So I went ahead and made a pattern that makes a lot more sense and will cast a lot better next time. I also used a Rust-Oleum Professional um, on the new pattern. So hopefully that's a harder paint that doesn't stick very well to parting powder. And I'll try that out soon. But that's the end result, came out pretty good. And um, like I said, a little Dremel Magic helped it out a lot to get that bomb end cleaned up.
Mmm. Them biscuits sure look good. Mm hmm. That was my terrible slim blade impression. But anyway, there's my uh, biscuits or ingots that I made with the biscuit pan. And there's the markings on them for hard drive and car parts. And that's how I keep them separated so I know which aluminum does what and how well. Also, it fits in my crucible a lot better uh, than longer parts or whatnot. This is the Haboob slash Sandstorm. I uh, pushed up the reddish orange a little bit because the camera actually did a white balance and it still doesn't show exactly how orange and weird it was that day with the sun and the uh, color of the sand and everything coming through there. But yeah, it was a real reddish orange and I'm sorry the camera just doesn't do it justice. But thanks for watching my channel and don't forget to subscribe and like. Thanks a lot.